stuff if you want. Um, it, it, it depends on if you have any questions regarding other stuff. So uh, everything is a poison, huh? It's just the dose that makes, the, it, makes it poison or uh, a remedy. Uh, if you drink too much water, you're gonna get hyponatremia, you can seize. If you have too much caffeine, which you all do at some point during your exams, you're gonna get tremulous, you can get tachycardia, and you might get even seizures, especially for kids, it can happen with caffeine. If you take a toxic substance like sodium uh, fluoroacetate or you take uh, cyanide, you, you, you get uh, poison and you could die uh, even from a few milligrams. Right. How does uh, toxins um, uh, cause uh, poisoning how does the, the what's the mechanism of toxicity so there are several several mechanisms we cannot uh, actually it's impossible to confine them to specific uh, mechanisms but these are the most common ones so you have direct tissue damage from uh, corrosive substances like acid or alkali uh, sometimes some 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 substances may cause uh, idiosyncratic reactions which has which are reactions that are not usually expected it's just and that's why it's called idiosyncratic. Some medication, you give someone a medication and then suddenly they develop fever, they get uh, joint swelling, uh, they get uh, acute uh, reaction. That's not expected from, from that medication. And these are, for, fortunately, these are very rare. And then you have the common mechanisms of medications that act usually either on receptors, um, either agonist or antagonist, or sometimes a partial agonist and then other stuff that acts on enzyme or metabolic pathways. Um, I'm sure you know what's an agonist, sah? Uh, an agonist is a, a xenobiotic or a substance that acts on a receptor and does the same effect as an endogenous substance. Yani, for example, you have norepinephrine, which is an endogenous substance, acts on alpha receptors and cause vasoconstriction. An agonist is a drug that, uh, like phenylephrine, will go into the same receptor, alpha receptors, and cause vasoconstriction. An antagonist is something that binds to the, the receptor and prevent the action of the endogenous substance, yeah, any, uh, a beta blocker. A partial agonist, does anyone know what's a partial agonist? Okay, so uh, a partial agonist is a, a substance or xenobiotic, a, a, a medication usually, that binds to the receptors and produce an effect, but it's not to the maximum effect as the endogenous substance. Example, عليها زي الأريبيبرازول في ال في في السايكاتري. هذه لها ميزة إنه أحيانا تكون كأنها antagonist. إذا كان ال effect حق ال حق ال indigenous substance is too much, you can use a partial agonist. It will act as an antagonist, but it was won't cause the side effect of an antagonist. Then we will still have some effect. All right. So when when we talk about uh, substances that cause um, direct tissue damage, these are usually, as we said, acids, alkalies, corrosive substances, and um, we see this a lot, we, and you're gonna see it every single day um, because of kids uh, accidentally get, getting into these uh, substances. Taban, the approach to this is usually simple. So um, this is a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it's a nice article, but I don't agree to, to some of the points. So you have someone who ingested a caustic, you wanna know whether it's an acid or an alkali uh, because there is a difference, right? I'm sure most of you know, uh, an acid will cause coagulation necrosis while the an alkali will cause uh, uh, liquefactive necrosis. Coagulation necrosis results in protein uh, precipitation and form an eschgar or a, 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 a base that prevent the penetration of a substance further into the, uh, the tissue. While an alkali cause liquefactive necro necrosis and it penetrates deeply in the tissue. It subunificates the tissues, it slices the lipids. So when you get someone who ingested these, regardless of what they took, um, you will look at first, are they symptomatic or not? If they are symptomatic, then um, how badly, how bad are their symptoms? Is it just mild vomiting? Do they, um, are they having drooling? Are they having multiple symptoms at the same time? If they are just simply have one episode of vomiting, they look okay, you can just observe them. And uh, if, they, uh, if they, they're fine during the observation, then you can give them clear liquid to see if they can tolerate it. And then if they can't tolerate it, they will be able to go home most likely. If they have multiple symptoms or severe symptoms, like if they have stride or any upper airway issue, then these patients might need an eerie, might need an eerie intubation to protect their airway, and they will probably need a scope to look for the uh, significant injuries. Um, 
And I see people asking, why would we do a scope? Because most of the time we'll not do anything about it. It's very important for several reasons. One reason is when this patient can, when could this patient eat and drink? If they have severe injury, you probably won't feed them for a few days until some healing happens. If they have uh, perforation, then they, they won't be feeding. They will go to the uh, operating room. If they, um, if they have a, C, a grade 2B injury, which is like a, a deep circumferential ulcer, then they might be a candidate for steroid and, and um, an antiacid. But the main reason we care in the emergency is we want to do this early on because later on the tissue will be so frail that the endoscopy itself may cause perforation. All right. Um, I put X here because this article said that if you have an acid, you, need, you go directly to endoscopy. Basically, they're seeing this. They're saying this because there is not enough data to say whether you go for endoscopy or not. But I still follow the same approach. If they have symptoms, uh, um, if, if it's severe symptoms, then they will need endoscopy. If they basically just have mild vomiting and they otherwise well, you can observe them. If symptoms resolve, you can um, discharge them. They will be if they can tolerate or in, intake. So it's the same for acid and alkali. All right, so this is just from the same article. If you have a circumferential uh, ulcer, then the, the likelihood of de developing um, a structure is very high and these patients will, might, might in some studies, they, they benefit from steroids. So a short course of steroid uh, might be indicated. That's usually not our decision. It's the, the, uh, the gastroenterologist decision, but it's good to know about what's, what's, what the evidence says. So mostly it's grade 2B, they might benefit from three days of methylbrednisolone with RANITD um, in, one, in one good study at least. All right, so um, why am I bringing this? Is just to make you confused and to make you hate me. Um, uh, the, uh, actually, the, the reason for this is uh, drugs, their, their onset of action depends on how they act, not just... Uh, not just the, the time it takes for them to be absorbed and get into the systemic circulation, but also in the mechanism of their action. If you have something that acts on a channel, like a sodium channel blocker, um, potassium channel blocker, their action is very fast, in milliseconds. And that's like our uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. Here you have the nicotine and acetylcholine receptors. So these, the, the action of these drugs will be very fast and you will see an effect immediately in the, in the emergency. There are other drugs that bind to a ligand in the channels. They have, they have a port for a ligand, like a G protein, and, 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 and the, 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 their action will be a little bit more delayed. It will take seconds, minutes, uh, sometimes. And then if they need to uh, change a protein trans, uh, transcription um, in, in, and need to affect enzymes uh, uh, production, then they, they take hours. And if they need to act into in, in intracellular receptors like steroid, it will take multiple hours and even sometimes days like thyroxine, for example. Drugs that act on channels that we expect them to cause um, uh, symptoms early um, is like TCAs, uh, anticonvulsants and antiarrhythmics, because most of these act on channels. The TCA acts on the sodium channels, also on the potassium channel, and the anticonvulsants acts on the sodium channels, antiarrhythmics, some of them on the sodium, some of them on the potassium, some of them on multiple channels. So these will have early onset. Uh, uh, drugs that act on surface rece receptors and usually uh, involve G protein is like beta, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, antihistamines. They will have a, a rapid onset, but usually slow, slower than the first class. And then you have stuff like steroids and thyroxine. They will take so long time to act. Steroid, we're not worried about an overdose of steroid usually. Um, but for thyroxine, they can get bad toxicity, but you're not going to see it for a few days, maybe a week or even two weeks. So the approach to these patients is to instruct them to um, watch for the symptoms onset and uh, you bring them back uh, after a few days and you do the TSH level, uh, depending on the dose, of course, if it's, if it's a large dose, like more than um, five milligrams of thyroxine. Then stuff that affects enzymes like the AC inhibitor, colchicine, and iron, it will take hours to, uh, to show effect. Like, uh, 
pharmacokinetics, I'm sure you all know this from pharmacology. Pharmacokinetics is the effect of the, what, does, what the body does to the drugs or toxins at therapeutic doses. Toxicokinetics is what the body does to the drug or toxin at toxic doses. Is it important? I think it's very important. In order to understand and think about what is going to happen to the patient, you need to understand these to expect the clinical course. So, and this involved the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and uh, excretion or elimination. So, absorption, um, bioavailability will determine uh, the effect of the, the systemic effect of the drug. Uh, the bioavailability, I wish I can ask questions. Uh, I'm not used to doing this. So the, um, the bio bioavailability is how much of the drug reached to the systemic circulation or the substance reached to the systemic circulation unchanged. And um, uh, for example, paracetamol has excellent oral bioavailability. It's about 98%, while uh, let's say vancomycin, oral vancomycin has zero oral bioavailability, almost zero oral bio bioavailability. And how do we measure this? We give the drug as an, at the same time, IV and oral at the same time, and we measure the concentration. And we compare these, and that's what, how we determine bioavailability. A drug that has very poor bioavailability, the likelihood of systemic toxicity from it is, is low. Then we need to know whether it's, it's, it's uh, immediate release preparation or sustained release because the onset of action will be delayed in sustained release preparation. For example, if calcium channel blocker is an immediate release, usually we'll see effect within two hours maximum by four, six hours we have, we have reached the, um, the maximum serum concentration or see effect. While if you see sustained release calcium channel blocker, you're not expecting effect until after 12 hours. So it's very dangerous if you discharge these patients home, thinking that they're stable after six hours, they might get really sick after 12 hours. And I've seen patients like that. Distribution, um, again, uh, is it clinically important? I think it is. Yeah, it, it will affect also how you think about the patient. For example, you give someone, um, someone took uh, digoxin and come to the emergency department, uh, elderly lady having vomiting, look a, bit, a little bit confused, and then you do a digoxin level and it's high. And then you say, okay, now she's digoxin toxic, she has confusion um, uh, and, and, and she's vomiting and, and the level is high. Uh, but if you don't know that the, the drug is uh, get, gonna get distributed and the level that you judge on is the steady state level, then your, 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 uh, your uh, decision will be wrong. So you have to wait until it's a steady state, unless the patient have clearly have like bradycardia, hypotension, these are different uh, uh, symptoms. Also, um, you, you will, when you're following uh, levels of drugs, you have to know that some drop will be just because of distribution um, until you get um, the, 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 the main elimination method, whether it is, it is metabolism or excretion. Uh, someone said alkali because the body cannot neutralize it. No, it's not true. It's because of the nature of the substance. It lies the tissues. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, in acid, you get the, the Ishkar formation, the protein precipitation, and this stops the penetration of the toxin. But in alkali, um, it penetrates deeply. All right. Okay, volume of distribution, again, very important because we decide whether, if we wanna decide whether to measure a level of a drug or uh, decide on hemodialysis, we need to know what's the volume of dis distribution. It's, in, and it's not a true volume, it's an apparent volume. Um, basically, what I want you to remember is this is how much of the drug is in the systemic circulation in the, in the plasma compared to how much of the drug is in the tissue. If you look at, the pictures here, you see this drug is um, is, is a very large uh, drug. It cannot cross membranes, and that's why it's confined to the plasma. If you look here, this one is um, is water soluble drug, so the penetration and the the, the 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 movement of the drug to the tissues is small because you need to be lipid soluble to cross the membrane easily. An example of this is uh, ASA aspirin. Um, uh, the 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 other category is the lipid soluble drugs, which can be mainly stored in the tissues. And um, in, in the serum, there is very little of it. And these drugs uh, are usually highly lipid soluble. 
Uh, example of this is TCAs. Most of the drugs that act on the brain are a little bit soluble because they need to cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you think of a drug that we give to treat psychiatric symptoms, neurologic symptoms, think of stuff that are highly lipid soluble and unlikely to be dialyzable. This is a general rule, but that um, some, some exceptions exist. So we said they are not dialyzable because if you remove this much, small amount, it's not gonna change the clinical course, so it's useless. While if you remove half of the amount or more than half of the amount which is existing in the serum, then it, it, it's clinically re relevant. Uh, uh, so, in general, we see a small, a small volume of distribution is the volume of distribution that's less than one liter per kg. And the examples are astaminophen, um, phenytoin, carbamazepine, and valproic acid. Uh, a large volume distribution, TCA, digoxin. Digoxin is not highly lipid soluble, it's highly water soluble, but it distributes to the body water in large amounts. So, uh, it's not, you, you're not gonna be able to catch it with dialysis, antipsychotics and antidepressants. Okay, so less than one, usually dialyzable, more than one is usually not. Again, if you have a small volume, volume of distribution, the level of the drug usually correlates with toxicity. And um, as, as we said, it's potentially dialyzable. If you have a large volume of distribution, then most of the drug is concentrated in the tissue, so the level does not mean much. That's why we don't do TCA level, it's useless. All right, so um, I just wanna talk about some drug interaction that we always see. Um, uh, it's, we have different classes of drugs based on their uh, binding to plasma protein. If you, take, if you take class one, for example, they have, um, the amount of the drug is very small compared in, in the usual doses that we use is very small compared to the binding sites in albumin. So a lot of the albumin sites are still available for the drug to bind, so we have no issues there. But some, if you combine a class two drug, which is usually we give doses in very large amount that um, saturate the uh, albumin binding, then <clears throat> you could release the class one drug from the albumin binding and you, you cause more of it to be free and can act and cause toxicity. An example here is warfarin. If you have uh, warfarin uh, at therapeutic doses and then you prescribe a patient sulfonamide for, um, for let's say UTI, for let's say UTI, then you displaced warfarin from the from the albumin and you cause toxicity. And we gonna we see this a lot in clinical practice. It's uh, it's very relevant. And why 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 did I choose warfarin? Is because um, this toxicity when you have a large amount of a free drug, um, uh, the uh, the impact of this free drug depends on how lipid soluble it is, how how what's the volume of distribution of it, because of this free drug goes all in the tissues, it's not a big deal. Uh, but if it stays and binds to the um, receptors, then it can cause uh, a bad toxicity. And again, is also the therapeutic index. The warfarin therapeutic is, index is very small, and usually we have very tight uh, control of INR. And when you have just small increase in the free warfarin, it can cause um, a significant rise in the INR and bleeding. So yeah, very important to know which drugs are dialyzable, which are not, because um, sometimes you need to make a decision early on and uh, you need to put the dialysis line before the patient deteriorates and start your treatment. So, so we move on. We talked about absorption, uh, importance of knowing when the drug is gonna get absorbed, what kind of formulation of the drug, is in order to expect the clinical effect. The other, the other, um, thing is the distribution of the drug. Where is it? Is it in the blood or is it in the tissues? Can I remove it by dialysis or not? And then we go to metabolism. Mainly metabolism, I'll focus on just one thing, saturable kinetics versus non-saturable kinetics. And uh, in other words, zero order versus, versus first order. Most of the drugs are first order. They're not saturable. Until they get into very large concentrations, then they become that the, the metabolism becomes saturated, and then you have a problem of drug elimination. There are a few exceptions like alcohols; they are, get saturable easily. Or if you take large doses of aspirin, then you move from first order to 
uh, zero order metabolism. Uh, I'm going to explain this more to you because aspirin is important and I think you need to know. It. So this is the, uh, uh, let's say the enzyme that metabolizes the drug. And then if you have um, non-saturable kinetics, then you have, so you have so much binding sites that you can accommodate so much of the drug and you can metabolize the drug in proportion to its concentration because you, or you have enough uh, metabolizing enzyme to metabolize the, the, the proportion that you want to metabolize. Um, so here you have a bus, and you have 3 seats, and you have 20 seats. Even if the number of seats has you still have room to, to, to accommodate them. And the, when we talk about metabolism, we talk about percentage of metabolism. And when you have, you know that you're metabolizing percentage of the drug that you have in the system, then you know you have um, a half-life. But ultimately, all the drugs can be, um, can reach to zero order kinetics if you have huge amounts. So again, we still, we had more, more of the drug, but we have a lot of room to metabolize. Well, if you have saturable kinetics, like in what happens in, ACE, uh, in aspirin, then you occupy the, um, uh, the sites for metabolizing the drugs. So now all the enzymes are occupied. So you are only gonna be able to metabolize fixed amount over time. Until these, these three are metabolized, then you can use, you can put another three. So it's fixed amount over time, regardless of how much you have in the system. You have thousand, you're gonna metabolize only three at a time. That's saturable kinetic. I hope it's clear. These guys are gonna wait until their turn, until these, the other ones are metabolized. Okay, so when you have non-saturable kinetic, you have a half-life because you know you're, you're metabolizing a, a, a percentage of the drug at a time. You, um, this is the majority of the drugs usually. Uh, it's called first order kinetics. So the normal is first order kinetics. Um, but if you have huge amount in overdose, and if everything, even astaminophen can get saturable, the, the, the metabolism can get saturable and you get um, prolonged half-lives, you, uh, you, 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 you get to metabolize fixed amount for drug over time. If you have saturable kinetics, then you have no clear half-life because you're only metabolizing a certain um, amount over time, not related to how much uh, uh, drug concentration you have in the system. Examples of this is alcohol is very important. Phenytoin is another example, and uh, warfarin. And a small change in a dose can cause very much, um, can change the duration of action uh, significantly when you have saturable kinetics. Okay. Now, a lot of people ask, why do we commonly observe patients for four to six hours in toxicology? And you always make fun of us in toxicology saying that, hey, yeah, you just observe them for six hours and then let them go home. Is it based on anything? Usually, the severity of, uh, of poisoning happens when you have the maximum serum concentration. And you reach the big serum concentration or the maximum serum concentration for most of the drugs within um, six hours or less. So that's why we say, if the patient by six hours does not have any symptoms, then we're not expecting uh, bad toxicity in most of the drugs. We have exceptions like extended release preparation, as I said, calcium channel blockers. We know they're not gonna have symptoms until 12 hours or, or even beyond. Aspirin, because it causes a base war and it causes um, bilorric spasm. So it's, it, it can be, the, the big concentration can take 20 hours. Um, some, uh, some toxins that um, have the toxicity is due to the metabolite. Um, it, it's going to take time because you need to metabolize the drug to the metabolite, and then the metabolite is going to cause the toxicity. Example is estaminophen, right? You need the napki to cause the toxicity. So it takes time. We know estaminophen toxicity is not going to show within six hours. They're going to be fine usually within the first six hours or may have mild nausea and vomiting. Do you have, do you know any other drugs that are, um, their metabolites are toxic, but themselves, they're, they're not that toxic themselves? Any idea? Yes, methanol, thank you. Which is formic acid, good. Ethylene glycol, glycolic acid, good. Okay, good, okay, so someone is listening. 
All right, next. So approach is the same as anything in emergency. And you're gonna get this drilled in your, in your head, especially the, the junior guys, you're gonna hear ABCs every time and it's, it's correct and we always follow that. Um, maybe just in cardiac arrest we go C uh, first, but most of the time we go ABCs. All right, in toxicology, just be careful with patients presenting yearly, they may look fine and then um, suddenly deteriorate and develop seizure. And also if you have any patient who's altered after an overdose, check the glucose, please. So many toxins cause hypoglycemia, insulin, oral hypoglycemic, um, even uh, some antidepressants like venlafaxine have been reported to cause hypoglycemia. Um, and seizure, why we care about seizure? Because if you don't predict it early and you don't know that the drug might cause seizure, you might do crazy stuff like giving activated charcoal to a drug that causes seizure right away. So then the patient will vomit and aspirate. You need to be prepared. You put the uh, anti um, epileptics on the bedside so you can treat early. All right. And then with the D, we, we talk about decontamination. Decontamination is, um, is um, uh, it, it can be done in multiple ways, including external decontamination, internal decontamination, and so on. And we'll talk about that later. Um, then uh, the E for toxicology is enhanced elimination and exposure because uh, sometimes you have patients who are coming for, let's say, for, um, uh, with uh, opioid toxidrome and you're treating them with naloxone and you keep giving large doses and they're, they're not getting better. When you flip them, you find a fentanyl patch in the back. It, has, it happened to me before. Uh, it's not impossible. So expose them. Make sure that you remove all the medication. I had one patient who was admitted for paracetamol overdose and they did not expose the patient. They did not take everything from him. Went to ICU, took another overdose in the ICU. So uh, it's important to do good exposure. And then you think of antidote. Usually antidote, most of the antidote, you have time to resuscitate and then think about it. There are a few exceptions, like while you're doing resuscitation, you need to give the antidote. Like let's say, um, cyanide toxicity um, uh, and uh, uh, let's say uh, what um, I cannot think of anything that I have to rush to give antidote maybe someone who's seizing persistent seizure you have to think of toxicity and you give pyrodoxine and then general supportive care without good supportive care it's useless yeah good somebody saying naloxone naloxone Yes, but you can actually manage without it. Um, you can you can support their breathing, and you can you can uh, you can uh, the patient could survive without the antidote. Um, although, if you know it early, you might uh, uh, prevent intubation and uh, its associated complications. Uh, with naloxone, please, it's not the the, this, the 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 cure of the situation. The cure of the situation is you open the patient airway, you bag them, and then you give naloxone. Um, if there are case reports of patients uh, given naloxone and then they walk up and they breathe again is the closed uh, glottis and they get um, uh, pulmonary edema from excessive negative pressure. Okay, so airway, just think about it when we talk about the caustics. Um, I had a consult a few weeks ago uh, from the periphery. Uh, the doctor is telling me the patient has strider, he's drooling, and he had just detoled. I was like, okay, he had just detoled. Maybe he's allergic to detol, and that's why he has an upper airway issue. I don't care what he took, just protect this patient airway. And he was like, it is detol. I don't care. It's the clinical picture. Um, so, yeah. So, be, be an emergency physician. How long after an acid ingestion is the Ishkar formation? And if the acid is ingested in large amount, will the Ishkar still be beneficial? Yes, that's a good question. So there is no fixed time. So again, there are several factors that affect the depth of injury. It's the, the, the pH of the acid. So if it's a strong acid, a pH of less than two, then the damage will be deeper. The, the duration of contacts, if it's a large amount, then it's gonna stay on the surface for a longer time and it's gonna cause further damage. So that's gonna affect how long the scar is, is found. Uh, is formed. So the Ishkar is beneficial to some extent if you compare it to alkali, but it's not always protective. You can have an acid injury that's so deep that they get uh, mediastinitis or peritonitis. Okay. All right. Um, 
So as I said, we are emergency phys physicians. We know better than um, just depending on um, uh, book knowledge. Okay, breathing, respiratory rate. Unfortunately, here and everywhere in the world, everybody has a respiratory rate of 20, um, which is not always true. Uh, so look at the respiratory rate. Um, make sure you, you look at it carefully and you, you report it uh, carefully because it's going to change what you do. If you have someone who uh, took aspirin overdose and they're already tachypnic and have um, respiratory alkalosis, these patients need um, urine and serum alkalinization early on uh, to prevent further toxicity. If, you, if you, the respiratory rate is 20, then we're going to wait until we get the metabolic acidosis and then we realize the, 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 the situation. Yeah, nerve gas agents, yes, and cholinergic, yes, we'll need an antidote as soon as possible. We'll talk about that soon. All right, so we don't need to have an antidote if we give good supportive care to most poisoning, uh, uh, with a few exceptions. The other reason why we need to know the, the respiratory rate is when we're uh, intervening with this patient and uh, doing uh, either intubation or uh, we're, we're, we're bagging them, we have to consider their minute ventilation. So we have to give them as close minute ventilation as uh, what they came with. Otherwise, the CO2 will accumulate and we'll have severe acidosis and the patient may go into cardiac arrest, okay? Again, with tachypnea, sometimes patients with organophosphate poisoning, they, the only thing they have is some secretions and tachypnea, so we know that they need atropine. Patients with sympathomimetic toxicity, they will have also tachypnea, but they will have other features. Um, when it comes to circulation, toxicity is, again, it's the same as, uh, as anything else in emergency medicine. We, we start supporting these patients with fluids. We move to inotropes early on because we think this vasodilatory shock, for example, is due to blockade of alpha receptors. Then uh, you're going to give a huge amount of fluid. It's not going to work. So you're going to need to move on to something that antagonizes the effect of the toxin. Again, if you have a patient who's hypotensive from cardiac dysrhythmia, uh, you have to think of sodium bicarb because a lot of the poisons will cause sodium channel blockage, and that's how they cause the white complex tachycardia. And if you give sodium bicarb, you're going to fix their rhythm and you're going to fix their pressure. If you have someone who is hypotensive from calcium channel blocker and beta blocker overdose, you're going to start the pressors, but then you're going to start high dose insulin and glucose and you titrate your pressors down. It's a very effective antidote. And think of DigiBind if you have a patient who's unstable and is on digoxin and you think they're digitoxic. So small, small deviations. Again, if you have a patient who's really hypertensive from an overdose, we don't rush to give um, uh, antihypertensive drugs. We like to use benzodiazepines and it works, I'd say 90% of the time, 90, 95% of the time. If it doesn't work, we like to use um, selective alpha antagonists like fentolamy. Um, the, there's a common teaching, and it's still in the book, to avoid beta blockers in sympathomimetic toxicity because of the anabosed alpha. As you know, uh, when you have someone who has sympathomimetic toxicity, their alpha and beta receptors are stimulated. Their beta-2 receptors in the vessels will cause vasodilatation. So if you block these, you're going to cause, the theory is you're going to cause severe vasoconstriction. This is based on very few case reports. The rise in the blood, the rise in the blood pressure was to me, was not significant at all. And uh, so many people are criticizing this. But as of the, the time being, we still have good anti um, like uh, fent uh, fentolamine, which is safe. We can use it. We can use uh, nitroglycerin, which is the same thing. Like it's, it's not going to block the beta receptors, but it's going to reduce their blood pressure. What someone is asking, cholinergic drugs, pesticide, nerve agent, would need atropine as soon as possible. Isn't there a literature that contradicts that? There is no literature that contradicts um, the use of atropine. Oh, alhamdulillah. Yes, uh, there is no uh, literature that contradicts atropine. There is literature that contradicts the use of oxines. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, so, Muhammad, you can, you probably can speak. I was, I, I was, I, I brought two things. What about the slack and guess they know. Uh, uh, for cholinergic toxicity, that's something you would need to give atropine ASAP because uh, um, uh, they, they're going to dr uh, drown in their secretions, and that's something yeah. that you might need to give it as upfront. And I, and I meant uh, literature that contradicts uh, uh, the beta blockade in uh, in uh, sympathomimetic toxicity. I thought there's some the people have kind of let 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 go of that for the most part. 
yes, that's what I was uh, trying to say. It's not, it's not as as robust this this uh, this um, statement of avoiding beta blockers. But uh, as of this uh, until now, we don't have also great literature to say that they are very safe. They have been used, but they're. I have other options. Why would I put myself into risk? And uh, I don't know what the oxymes are, by the way. And is that like 2PAM or? Yes, yes, yes. I thought that's what you're referring to in the atropine uh, discussion. So the, the 2PAM, praliduxime, and, uh, and, uh, and the other oxymes, they're, they're, their use is controversial. We'll talk about them later. Use monitors. Um, uh, I would say freely, uh, if, you're, if you're not sure, just put the patient in a monitor, be in the safe side. Okay, this is very important for, uh, for the residents, especially the junior ones that have never seen this. Um, the, um, the action of sodium channel blockers and potassium channel blockers. So this is what you're mostly going to see in toxicology. is a drug that affects either this or that or both. So if you have a drug that acts on the sodium channel, look at the action potential, the cardiac, uh, the myocyte action potential. Phase zero is the rapid influx of sodium. A lot of sodium gush into the cells causing depolarization and the continuation of the action potential. If you block the sodium channel, then this phase zero is gonna be very slow. You see how it's going? Same time, look at the QRS, it's getting wider because the depolarization is taking longer time. Okay, and if this goes too big, if the, the blockade is, is, is large, then you're gonna get very wide QRS, you're gonna go into ventricular tachycardia. And how do we treat this? If we give them what? Sodium load, we give them sodium bicarb. Sodium bicarb does two things. Provide sodium load to act on the channel, whatever channels are available. And also, it reduced the affinity of the TCA to the receptors, reduced this, the, the strength of binding of the TCA to receptors, okay? So to treat this is to give sodium bicarb, okay? And if you look at the potassium channels, the phase one is the sodium, then a closure of the sodium channels, and then the phase two is maintained by the um, uh, calcium, uh, uh, the plateau is maintained by the calcium, and then you have opening of the potassium channels and rapid efflux of the potassium getting out of the cells, and that's where riborization happening. Um, and then you go to the resting membrane potential, which is maintained by the sodium-potassium ATBase bump. So if you have something that blocks the potassium channel, then potassium cannot get out fast from the cells, and then the action potential gonna be also delayed. The, the reborization phase of the action potential is going to be delayed. The reborization phase in the cardiac cycle is going to be delayed, which is the QTC interval. So you see, instead of being like this, it's going to go longer, longer, longer until you get into the next QRS, and then you get R on T phenomena, and you get what we call TORSAT. The treatment for that is to stabilize the membrane with magnesium. All right. Okay. So um, what we see here is a classic sodium channel blocking AC, uh, effect e uh, on ECG. Uh, the things that you need to remember is always look for a wide QRS when you, when you expect uh, sodium channel blocking effect, like someone coming with a TCA overdose, some someone coming with Villa vaccine overdose, someone coming with uh, lidocaine overdose, then you look for wide QRS and a classic terminal R in AVR, which is a big R wave in the AVR lead, you will see in most patients either incomplete or complete right bundle branch block. Now, why am I saying this? Because sometimes people see left bundle branch block and they keep giving sodium bicarb, it's not gonna work. The, the reason for a left bundle branch block is not usually a sodium channel block. All right, so if you don't treat that, this is what's gonna happen. And how do we treat it? We give boluses of sodium bicarb, you can give two to three amps at a time, and you keep the ECG on the patient, and you keep repeating ECGs until you see the QRS closing. Um, some people will run an infusion. You, you put three amps of sodium bicarb in a liter of D5 water, and you, you run it at two times maintenance. Other people prefer to give boluses. I like to give boluses because I give it when I need it, I, as long as I have good monitoring for the patient. If it's in the periphery, sometimes I tell them to start the, the infusion just to be in the safe side. All right, 
when, uh, when potassium channels are blocked, we said the QTC is prolonged, right? So, and the, the way to look at the QTC is either you look at the ECG and you look at the corrected QTC, and if it's more than 500, then there is risk of torsad. Or if the, if, the, if the end of the T wave, the end of the QTC is um, at more than half the distance between the two R waves, then you know you have a prolonged QTC. We're worried because this is just longer, 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 and then reach to the next QRS, you get an R and T phenomena, and you get um, this rhythm, okay? Torsa, torsa de bois. One up, one down. Um, treatment of this is magnesium sulfate. And of course, you stop the drug, you correct any other abnormality. If you have hypokalemia, they're still gonna have prolonged QTC. They're still be at risk of developing torsad. So you have to correct other right abnormalities, hypo, um, yeah, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. All right. So when you have a patient who's in ventricular fibrillation or VTAC from uh, a boys, then just keep resuscitating this patient. There is survival reported with good neurologic outcome, outcome even after 70 minutes of resuscitation. So please continue resuscitation. Call for advice if you, if you wish. Um, I would recommend that. And then look for refers, reversible stuff. Hydrofluoric acid, we don't see it much these days, which is good. Uh, usually, uh, most commonly, it's seen in uh, people who use it for rust removal. And it's, a, it's a, a white powder. It causes extreme corrosive damage in the tissues. Um, it causes also in large amounts, even if you have a palm, um, a size of a palm of, um, of uh, hydrofluoric acid, it can cause systemic hypocalcemia. So monitor their calcium and they may need IV calcium infusion. Sodium channel blockade, we talked about uh, tricyclic antidepressants and uh, antiarrhythmics and some other like uh, SNRIs like venlafaxine. Uh, you need to give sodium bicarb for these. Uh, there are, you know, the uh, myocardial uh, sensitization by catecholamines. You heard about the kids who sniff uh, glue or sniff other hydrocarbons, especially halogenated hydrocarbons. They get caught by family or caught by police. They get stressed and suddenly they have rush of catecholamines and their myocardium is sensitized to catecholamines by the uh, hydrocarbons and then they go into VTAC or VFib store. Um, a short-acting beta blocker like uh, ismolol might be useful in these situations, especially if you try resuscitating them and nothing is working, then you should think about it. Uh, and then think about DigiBind if a patient is uh, dish toxic and hypotensive or having any kind of arrhythmias. What is the only type of arrhythmia that cannot happen in dish toxic patient? Only one type of arrhythmia. All other arrhythmias are possible. Any answer? Yes, thank you. Uh, fast, fast atrial fibrillation, yes. So it's a fast atrial tachycardia that's conducted to the ventricle because DIG blocks the AV node. So you're not expecting a fast atrial arrhythmia to be uh, transmitted to the ventricle. But you can get ventricular tachycardia, you can get ventricular fibrillation, you can get any types of atrial tachycardia, but no, the ventricle is, um, the atria and ventricle are not talking. All right, again, some toxins, especially lipid soluble toxins, if we try everything and nothing works, we go to um, lipid. And when I say try everything, like if I have someone with TC overdose, I've given them uh, uh, bicarbs, giving them uh, lidocaine and giving them pressors and they're still unstable, I would just move to, um, to lipid because I know nothing is gonna help this patient. Unless I know I have a good uh, ECMO center and we have arrangements, and I know this patient can be on ECMO uh, shortly, then yes, that that's would probably be the best. Unless it's like a, 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 a bubivacaine toxicity or a local anesthetic, anesthetic where I know lipid works very well. But there are case reports of it working very well for uh, bupropion, for uh, amitriptyline overdose, and for uh, um, of course, the local anesthetic. So well, the theory is you have a lipid soluble drug. Yeah, 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 ECMO is better if we find someone to do ECMO, okay? <laughs> so uh, it's, it just creates a lipid sink. Um, you have a lipid soluble drug, you give, them, uh, you give the patient um, a lipid bolus IV, and then the lipid moves, the, the lipid soluble drug moves from the 
um, from the site of action, from the receptors into this lipid sink, gets sequestered there until it gets excreted. Again, I'm not a fan of it, but if I get stuck and I have no other option, I might consider it. I would suggest that you call the poison center before giving it just to be in the safe side. Uh, but it's, again, if the patient is dying and you have no other, um, other treatment options and you know it's lipid-soluble drug, I would just go ahead and give it. This is the dosing. You don't need to memorize it. It's just, it's very easy, very simple. Okay, good evidence for local anesthetic. Uh, lipid for calcium channel blockers. That's a good question. There are some reports of this, but again, calcium channels, yes. Beta blockers, it depends whether it's a water-soluble or lipid-soluble beta blocker. We have the high-dose insulin and glucose, and they work well, but they don't always work. I have had a patient with, uh, with amlodipine overdose. We give everything, everything. Uh, we give the high-dose insulin we reach to maybe 10 units per kg. We, we, we reached huge doses. We gave him pressors. We gave him, we started him on CRRT because we couldn't dialyze him. He was so sick. And we then gave him lipid, a bolus and an infusion. We don't know what worked. He survived at the end, but we're not sure. So again, it depends on the kind of a calcium channel um, of, the, of the toxin. Calcium channel blockers may be beta blockers if it is lipid soluble. I might consider it. I would rather use ECMO in these patients if I have it than, than lipid. In a cardiac arrest, yes, I would push it as a bolus because there is nothing else you can do. If it's lipid soluble again, if it's not, then what are you trying to do? Okay. That's a good question. Okay. So hypoglycemia, we said detect till, uh, uh, hypoglycemia, expected in any patient with alternate status. For hypoglycemia, Typically, we see it with insulin and with uh, sulfonyl uh, ureas. These are the most common. Insulin, most of the patients will be managing the ED. You give them dextrose. You, once they wake up, you feed them. You watch them for um, six hours. If they're fine, they go home. Unless it's a long-acting insulin, then you, they need admission for 24 hours. For oral hypoglycemics, everybody gets in. Everybody gets admitted. And if you give them uh, dextrose, and they get hypoglycemic again, then you start, what's the antidote? For um, sulfonylureas? Octoreotide, yes, thank you. So, um, good, thank you. So, octoreotide, you give octoreotide, 50 mics, sub-Q, and it's gonna last for six hours. You keep following this patient. These patients, as I said, they're gonna be admitted. After six hours, you recheck them again. You make sure that they're not hypoglycemic. After the last dose of octoreotide, we need at least, um, some say six hours, some say 12 hours, So, but make sure that you leave them long enough to make sure that they don't have rebound hypoglycemia, especially if they have renal impairment, because the drug is going to linger for a long time. Um, seizure, the best treatment for seizure in, uh, in toxicology, what is it? Phenytoin, right? Huh? Benzo, benzo. Yeah, everything is benzo in toxicology. I actually just say benzo when I'm sleeping, and that's the right answer usually. So uh, benzodiazepines. We In toxicology, when we have seizure, we have problem with excitatory versus inhibitory neurotransmitters balance. Usually, there is excess excitatory neurotransmitter causing seizure. It's usually um, a global seizure. It's a, it's a generalized seizure. It's rarely very, very, very unusual to see um, localized seizure from toxins. And it's because of the loss of balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So what you need is you need to increase the inhibitory neurotransmitters by giving something that increases GABA uh, directly, like benzodiazepines, like barbiturates, or um, propofol. If you have a patient who you suspect they have access to isoniazide and they have resistant seizure, then you have to give pyridoxine. Usually the dose is five grams IV. And phenytoin, it's, the books say contraindicated. I don't think it's going to cause any trouble, but it's not going to work because it works in the sodium channels. And we have no problems with, um, uh, it's, it's, not a it's not a elliptic focus that we have. We have, um, uh, so when you have an elliptic focus, you get a lot of the sodium channels that gets activated and uh, open and then get into an inactive state. Phenytoins, phenytoin act here and cause this inactive state to stay forever. It's like a refractory period in the heart. So it's a refractory period in the neurons, and that's, that's how it aborts the, uh, the seizure activity. 
But if you don't have seizure, then you don't have enough, sorry, if you don't have an epileptic focus, then you don't have enough channels in the inactive state that phenytoin can bind and inhibit. So there is no point of giving it. Hyperthermia, very, very important. Most of the toxins that cause hyperthermia, when the patient reaches to hyperthermia, their mortality goes up. Sympathomimetics um, is the best example of this. And we try to treat them very aggressively to correct their temperature because high temperature associated with mortality. Uh, astaminophen is not gonna work because this is hyperthermia, it's not fever. Um, do active cooling, external cooling, even if you have to do, to put them on dialysis and cool them or to do bypass and cool them, especially young, healthy patients. Okay, so this is a summary of what we said. So we need to resuscitate the patient, um, treat their hypoglycemia, treat their seizure, correct their temperature, and then administer antidote if you know an antidote. Um, make sure that you do proper risk assessment when you um, see these patients. Uh, I'll tell you why, because when I get calls in the middle of the night and sometimes they, they call because a child got into a medication and they don't know how much he took, Sometimes it's so simple that I ask them, how much is in the, how much is the, the, does the bottle normally contains? Like the bottle is like 90 tablets and how much is left? They, a lot of times they say we didn't count. I just ask them to count. And then there is at least um, uh, 80 tablets left. So 10 tablets, I calculate it's not toxic, we're done. So your job can be very simple. Um, it, it can save you a lot, save you a lot of time. So know how much is ingested, know the time of ingestion. Yeah, patient weight because it makes a difference. We always like to have the dose per kg, and hold the EMS guys. Ask them to wait because they might have some information. They might have some bottles. They might have. To, they might tell you something in the scene. Um, that I always ask them to call someone at home, get a picture of the bottle. This will give you some information, or get count them even at home. Um, um, sometimes you don't know what's going on with the patient and then you need to ask about the medications that are available at home, every single medication that's available at home. And always consider the worst case scenario. So if you have a bottle that contains 90 tablets and none of them is present, even if they say there might be something on the floor, then it's 90 tablets until you get the, 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 the accurate answer or you just assume that it's 90. After getting the history, uh, resuscitation, then getting your history, your physical examination. Toxicology physical exam is very short. It's a, it's a couple of minutes exam. You look at their heart rate, you look at their blood pressure, you look at the, basically their vitals, you look at the skin color and temperature, are they sweaty, are they dry? Um, uh, you, you like to examine the axilla because it's, it's usually wet in most patients and the, unless they have anticholinergic, something preventing them from sweating. Um, and we like to look at the eyes for uh, nystagmus and ocular clonus. We like to examine the limbs for reflexes and for tone, and that will get you your entire toxicology examination. So it doesn't take a lot of time. And the pupils, of course. So someone asking for the best time for endoscopy. As long as you do it within um, 24, um, 24 hours, I think is the best to avoid uh, injury, to avoid perforating the esophagus. Um, some prefer to wait for a bit to see the effect of the, the, the toxin. Some say between six hours and 24 hours. Um, I think as long as you do it before 24 hours, it should be okay. طيب عندي سؤال أبو عبد الرحمن. الديتورز أو المنظفات بشكل عام هذه اللي هي المفروض إنها ما تسوي يعني جي آي تراكت أو إيروي إنجري. Does it cause this in mega doses, مثلا, in a huge yeah. volume? Yes, it does. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. And I have seen cases. And a case of Dutol, I don't know if it was a big dose or the patient was allergic to it. He had an airway issue. He needed to be intubated. I have seen cases of sodium hypochlorate, um, Clorox. Okay. Clorox. Time, it doesn't cause anything then but if it's taken in large amount it can cause damage so your factors are the pH of the substance the amount of it the duration of contact an intentional overdose you have big doses where they try to swallow it very fast laggy little mouth damage but there is a lot of osphedial damage so 
in intentional overdose, even Clorox can cause damage. Usually not, but it can. Then the pH of the household is low. But in Saudi Arabia, there are a lot of and there are concentrations. Unfortunately, the regulation of them is not good. مو مو كلها زي كلوركس في الاشياء الارخص اللي تنباع في محلات الجمله وفي محلات سوق الاسواق الجمله والاسواق الشعبيه هذه يو نيفر نو وات از ذا كونسنتريشن في انواع مره كونسنتريت لانه لانه اجين يعني فروم وات اي فيس او يعني موست اوف كلوركس اوفر دوز كلهم دي باس يعني بيسفولي بدون اي مشاكل ما وذاوت اني كومبليكيشن بس اي سو ات توايس كانت انتنشنال uh, وكانت في ميلز ودي هاد يعني حتى اورال بيرنز في الاورال بيرنز ودي بوث اوف ذيم انتبيتد دي جوت انتبيتد و يا عشان كذا الجنرال رول غلط يعني رولز ار ميد فور ذا فودز كل شيء بالكلينيكال اسسمنت سيمتومز ار مور امبورتنت انتنشنال دي يوزولي نيد سكوب intentional most of the time they need a scope unless it's يعني انت تحس انه it was attention seeking the patient is okay or she's able to drink you don't have to scope them but i'm sure your patients were clearly not able to drink صح؟ right? yes yes yeah i have a question abdurrahman this is the jack marid and they often quote this and he has an ethanol level and he's intoxicated they tell you oh you know in eight hours this is the ethanol level It's going to be that. Um, is there any good science behind it, considering ethanol is zero-order kinetics? Ah, uh, uh, for the clearance of ethanol. Yeah, I don't. I don't think because it's different from one person, one patient to another. The regular drinkers will have different clearance uh, rate than the the naive drinkers. Um, I don't think there is a clear-cut um, clearance rate that you can uh, rely on. I don't think so. Sometimes we get surprised. They wake up very fast. Although chronic drinkers, we see the level is high. We think they're not going to wake up for at least eight, nine hours. They wake up faster than that. We don't know unless we, you know that this specific patient, uh, metabolic rate, you, you won't know. But when do you expect the symptoms of toxic alcohol to appear? Sometimes we have to wait for 24 hours. We measure serial um, ethanol level to make sure it's below, uh, in, our, in our units, below uh, 20 um, uh, to say that they are already starting to metabolize the methanol and we should see a toxicity. Okay. I have a um, uh, yani question uh, for you as a toxicologist. What do you think about uh, placing an NGT, uh, not doing proper uh, gastric lavage instead of gastric lavage doing a simple ngt suctioning if you if you're working in a hospital where you don't have uh, like uh, an antidote for a specific medication what do you think what do you think of doing this uh, as a toxicologist would you would you do it i'm, I'm just going to give an example if, if you're working in, in a hospital when and a patient uh, presented with uh, with like uh, calcium channel blocker uh, overdose and uh, and you didn't have anything to offer the patient they, uh, sometimes i worked in, in places where there were there was no icu uh, actually so would you do ngt suctioning simple ngt what do you think of that i i don't think it's going to get you anything the ngt is very small um very very tiny even the lavage tube, some tablets doesn't pass through the lavage tube. So I don't know how much you're going to get from it. Um, you're going to risk a uh, risk of aspiration and uh, complications from putting the NG. I don't think you're going to get much. Some, uh, some, some uh, toxicology textbooks will refer to doing it for like toxic alcohol early on, just happened now. Uh, I don't believe in that because it's going to be, it's going to be absorbed very rapidly. So I don't know how much benefit you get from an NGT. Uh, I think the safest, if you have a patient like this, is to give them activated charcoal if they are awake and do have no contraindication and transfer them if you think it's a big do- overdose. I don't, I don't think there is a science behind it. I don't think someone have done this and looked at how much you could remove from the NGT. Uh, okay, all right. So but you haven't uh, came across any evidence regarding the sample NGT suctioning, right? 
لا والله ما كنت شفته ما ادري اذا احد من الشباب شافه بس ما عمره مر عليه حتى ال 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 شو يسمونه جاستريك لباج الانديكيشن حقتها فيري ليمتد يعني اوفر دوس ذين 1 اور بريفرابلي ويذن 30 مينتس يب 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 اوكي ثانك يو يعطيك العافيه يا بدر 